Welcome to the intersection of city politics and everyday life. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, during this festive shopping season, we ask why all the empty storefronts in so many neighborhoods, both prosperous and struggling? What can government, what can citizens do to preserve the character of our city, which many have described as a cluster of small towns? Walk the streets and you can see there's clearly a blight of empty storefronts. This is the corner of Smith and Baltic Streets in Borham Hill, Brooklyn. Three out of four storefronts at this intersection remain unrented. And along Manhattan's main artery, Broadway, there were 188 shuttered stores at last count. Some have remained empty not just for months, but years. Tomorrow, the city council is expected to help small Manhattan shops in one way when they pass a bill freeing businesses below 96th Street from the commercial rent tax if the stores pay less, pay less than a half a million dollars rent each year. The exemption currently stops at a quarter million in rent. Relatively small change, believe it or not, nowadays. The new threshold should help about 2,000 businesses, we're told, but with so many empty storefronts, how come the invisible hand of capitalism doesn't correct the high rents by quickly lowering them when stores sit empty because no one can afford the rent? Let's address that and many other retail questions with our panel. Joining us, Carrie Jacobs, itinerant urbanist who recently wrote a piece entitled The Death and Life of Mom and Pops. She wrote it for Curb New York. She still pines for the eatery Florent, now a J. Crew owned Madewell in the Meatpacking District. Kenneth Mbono is here too. He's executive director of the Flatbush Nostrand Business Improvement District, which works to make those neighborhoods more attractive to firms, and it advises mom and pops how to stay afloat. And New York State Senator, Brad Hoyleman joins us as well. His 27th district ranges from the Upper West to the Lower East Side. His study illustrates how it's bleaker on Bleecker Street these days, how a wave of boutique chains pushed out local Greenwich Village specialty shops only to leave later en masse. Welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with you. Tell us about your study. Our study found a couple of things, Brian. First and foremost, the city doesn't collect data as it pertains to small businesses and vacancies. So we actually had to send interns out, volunteers, to determine how many storefronts were vacant. So that was the first finding. And we found almost one in five storefronts were vacant along Bleecker Street. Uh, and that's a considerable change, I think. New Yorkers who know the village know that Bleecker Street began as a mom and pop enclave. Then transferred to this high-end luxury retail shopping enclave around the time of Sex in the City, which is probably not a, a coincidence. And since then, though, the high luxury uh, department stores outlets have all left, including Ralph Lauren and, and Mark Jacobs. So now you have this essentially tumbleweeds uh, uh, kind of uh, vista uh, in one of the most densely packed uh, shopping areas in Manhattan. Tell us about Flat, Flatbush Nostrand, what's going on? Flatbush Nostrand Junction is buzzing. Um, you know, it's a diverse neighborhood, um, culturally distinct, strong Caribbean community, Jewish, South Asian, and Italian, actually on the, um, on the northern side. So it's di diverse cultures. We have a healthy mix of, of um, what I call independent stores, small businesses and the larger national chains like Target and Nike. So it's our, our intent or, you know, is to keep it diverse. We believe a diverse retail environment um, is conducive for the community and for the neighborhood. And um, so we're working hard at make, keeping, especially the independent businesses, remain sustainable during this challenging retail um, So trends. how different is it there, which has not been a super high-end neighborhood like the village, uh, in terms of vacancies? Are vacancies a, uh, ironically, a higher rent Manhattan kind of uh, no, no. problem? Well, no, it's not, because um, our, primarily our, our, build, our buildings are more on the Class C side. So, I mean, so those, it doesn't attract that kind of rent. 
But there is a, there is a, you know, our vacancy is pretty low, um, under four percent, and that's prim primarily because the businesses, um, you know, they understand what their target market is. But as that target market begins to change, um, what we are working at hard at the, the bid is to help these businesses identify the new market segments and um, their, their new clients and begin to introduce products slowly to attract those clients to their um, businesses. All right, so maybe a little better news from the lower rent, at least compared to the village and some other areas of Manhattan, uh, parts of the city. Carrier study is, uh, or your article was the death and life of yeah. mom and pops. Does that mean things are turning up? Uh, We've hit well, bottom, we're coming back? I, it, it's hard to say. I mean, the, the stores that, I mean, typically every New Yorker knows that when a new building goes up, there's always a bank branch and a chain drug store in the base of it, uh, which was always very mysterious to me until I learned the, the phrase credit tenants. What it means is that the banks that lend money to the developers demand a certain kind of tenant, a tenant that who, who would be reliable and who would pay the rent on a regular basis. The funny thing is that the stores that tend to be the credit tenants um, are possibly the ones most in danger of being displaced by you know online marketers like Amazon because they're the stores that you go to for generic products and I know that for example my health insurance insists that I buy I fill my prescriptions online and not go to a physical drugstore so it seems like there is a change happening and just yesterday I read an article um, in a, a real estate publication about uh, a trend which might not be a trend because they only gave two examples not three right but it was about the idea that uh, certain new buildings are seeking out independent booksellers and charging them lower rents the thought being that having an independent bookstore gives the building a certain cachet and will bring in uh, you know tenants willing to pay higher rents in neighborhoods like Prospect Lefferts Gardens or parts of the Bronx that maybe have not commanded high rents before and I took that as a harbinger of something. <laughs> I'm not sure. Do you, Senator? Well, I, I do because I, I think there are cycles. And after we released our report, I got a lot of calls from some angry landlords saying, you're blaming the landlords for everything. It's not just credit you know, worthiness. It is Amazon. It is the cycles of retail and, and how difficult look. It's not just Bleecker Street. It's Madison Avenue, as well as it pertains to luxury retail. But still. The, the, the examples still stand where the um, landlord, like the case in Florent, um, yeah, well, which, a, you, which that's you, an odd one. It's an odd one, but the rent was was raised eight times overnight. And I just went to my local stationer store this morning. He has a, a closing soon sign up. I asked him why, and he said because his rent is going up twenty thousand dollars next year wow. a month. Well, it's so, interesting. So, so, so it, is, it is the case that the <laughs> landlords are definitely seeking more money because they think they can get more money. And I really believe it is government's responsibility to step in and correct the market, which is way out of control. I was just going to say, the, the photo you showed at the beginning of the show of Smith Street in Baltic, my hairdresser has a little tiny shop a few blocks away. And when I was working on my article for Curbed, I asked her about you know, what rents were like. And she said that a lot of the vacant storefronts on Smith Street, they were asking $20,000 or more a month, which is crazy. And no local independent merchant could possibly pay that amount. Uh, so you sort of get the, you know, the hip chains, the rag and bone shops, people right. like that come in. But, you know, um, I also think, you know, we need to better define business size. Um, you know, the independent businesses, they're small businesses. We, sometimes we seem to categorize the small businesses as, you know, typically, I mean, the definition for a small business is anything doing under $25 million or having between 10 to 500 employees. But a lot of businesses in, in, um, in our corridor don't fit that. And um, so, you know, but they are still regarded as small businesses. I mean, if they're doing $250,000 a year, that is a lot. So I think we, we, we need to, and the banks, when the banks say small business, mm. it's, it's a, you know, 
maybe it is that language that the landlords are using and thinking that these businesses can actually afford to pay that kind of rent. I'm not sure they think that. You don't, you don't think so? I think they're fishing. for they're, look, they're out for bigger fish. They're out for banks and drugstore chains. Yes. Well, in the case of new buildings, I mean, there's two different things that happen. One is that old established businesses, the Florence of the world, the beloved local businesses, get pushed out by landlords who think that they can get a chain in there that can pay more money. That happens in existing buildings. And the other thing, the thing I was talking about, happens in new buildings where the developer is beholden to a bank and the bank gets to dictate uh, the kind of tenant that goes in. And that, that's why the, you know, the businesses that show up in new buildings are pretty homogenous and pretty boring and pretty predictable. And that's sort of the place where I thought that there might be a way to intervene in that process um, to have incentives for independently owned businesses. Um, Before we go on to some solutions, including models from other cities uh, like San Francisco and Barcelona, the other piece of this that I don't understand is the empty storefronts. Mm -hmm. I mentioned many along Broadway remaining vacant not just for months, but for years, which means the landlords can't get the rents that they're hoping for. And yet, you would think supply and demand, capitalism, the rent would therefore go down to meet what the richest possible tenant would actually pay. Why doesn't that happen? Well, there, there is a misconception that a landlord can write off the, the, the lost rent. Right. He or she, generally speaking, cannot. They can, though, deduct depreciation and management expenses, for example, for a vacant storefront. So, you know, they, they, they do consider that. But I think the real issue is they're continuing to hold out. Now, this is, generally speaking, not the smaller landlords. These are the landlords who may be absent, who may not even be in New York City. They're holding out for the credit-worthy tenant, for the chain, for the sweet green. How many sweet greens have we seen in Manhattan? Sure. I mean, you can, you know, get a salad know. I went, in I went any... I went Any to a real corner. estate board of New York luncheon, and one of the chains they brought up as being a really great example of business today is Sweetgreen. <laughs> so, so they're filling, they, they, they're, this is the latest trend, are uh, salad shops and cycling uh, shops, uh, you know, like Soul, Soul Cycle. Cycle. Yeah. You were going to add? Well, yeah, I, you know, and it's still, you, you had mentioned earlier, um, new, new buildings. So um, in, in other um, commercial dis districts, some of these businesses you are, you are talking about would not fit in there because the square footage, you know, they are, they are looking for a certain square footage size before they can move into. So it's, it kind of limits, you know, not on your, not in Manhattan, but more, you know, uh, it, you know, it limits the ability to penetrate into certain neighborhoods. Well, we, we, we have that problem on 8th Street where yeah. the, um, the square footage is very limited, the, right. the storefronts are very narrow. That's why shoe stores had been typically <laughs> along, along 8th Street. Now restaurants are trying to move in, right. and there has been a resurgence mm -hmm. on 8th Street, if you've noticed, uh, with, with new restaurants. They face a whole set of other challenges, and including the health department and, and utilities, uh, for example, uh, which is the subject of another uh, report that my office worked on. But, but, it, but, but you're right. A lot of the square footage does dictate, of course, you know, whether the landlord can get a right. new tenant or not. Carrie, what are they doing in San Francisco? Well, there's a couple of things in San Francisco. One is that they have a heritage registry of businesses, retailers that have been around. I forget the number of years, but once you get onto this registry, then there are grants for both the business and the landlord as incentives to keep that tenant there. And it's sort of an odd mix. There's some of the kind of North Beach favorites like City Lights Books, uh, you know, a place called Cafe Trieste, which is the coffee bar and a chain of um, sex, toy store, uh, sex toys for women, which are called Good Vibrations, that started in San Francisco were the examples that, that come to mind. Uh, and there are also rules in San Francisco about how many chain drugstores can be in a neighborhood that they, they have to get approval before they can move in. But I, I'm not sure San Francisco is, I mean, San Francisco is a, it's a funny city and it's, I'm not sure it's the model for New York. Why not? Because it's smaller? I, well, it's, it's, it's not just that it's smaller, it, it, it has this sort of tech boom in progress that distorts real estate values in all kinds of ways. Friends of mine in 
San Francisco are unhappy because their neighborhood grocery stores have all moved out because the grocery stores can't afford the rents there anymore. So even though there are these attempts to sort of manage um, the, you know, the retail environment, uh, they might not be the, the right things or the things that make the city livable. Um, you know, other cities, European cities, I was in Lisbon earlier this year, one of my former students was involved in a project there to um, make, designate historic stores, and their historic stores are really historic, you know, they're glove makers that have been around for hundreds of years, and, and the problem in Lisbon is it's only very recently become a tourist magnet, and so Old, and, and the real estate values had been very low, and so all these old stores had been displaced by store, stores selling, you know, refrigerator magnets or whatever tourists buy. And, and you've got some kind of idea for neighborhood trade-offs or trading of zoning. Uh, well, I've just always, I've just always thought that New York City could come up with a way to have incentives for, um, or you know, to attract and preserve small businesses uh, and independent merchants by using, you know, carrot rather than a stick, incentives rather than regulations. Um, and the article I discussed one way, which would be a zoning bonus for having independent merchants in your building instead of, you know, the Duane Reeds and the CVSs. Um, and, and that's one approach. I think there are probably other approaches. Um, but it just seems like it, it just seems like that that spot in the transaction where the bank is is asking for a credit tenant is some a place that a very smart city official might be able to insert themselves and 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 make a rule or make a change. Are, are you hearing anything there for government action? Absolutely. Uh, certainly, you know there are many cities uh, and states across uh, the country that have the same issue. Uh, I think the difference in part with San Francisco is, look, in City Hall in Albany, the real estate industry is king. And they do very much control a lot of, unfortunately, what we're able to do politically. So that's, that's challenge number one. Challenge, challenge number two is, you know, I, I think y you point out that it is very diverse in New York. But even, even the, the chain drugstores and, and and the banks are hitting a wall because of online right. retail shopping and sure. and and that's the, and that's the new reality but I'd like to see the state of New York uh, allow municipalities to pass restrictions on chains uh, they can't do that without Albany's approval so I have legislation that would allow the city of New York to restrict formula zoning for example Kenneth would anything like that be relevant to Flatbush Nostrand definitely but you know um, Many of these independent stores, it's also, even if we come up with these incentives, but will they still be able to remain sustainable in this changing dynamic retail environment? What we have been working very hard at is we're trying to be proactive here and saying, look, at the end of the day, you cannot consider yourself to be just a retail store mm -hmm. anymore. You might have to look at being a retail, a storage, and also begin to begin to understand the dynamics around social media and how you can begin to connect with your client, with your clients and potential um, clients. It's, it's you, you are wearing three, we're trying to create, let them to, trying to get them to understand the health around creating diverse revenue streams. Because this retail uh, technology is creating such a dynamic force in the retail um, sector, even if we com the government comes up with all these incentives and people still go online to shop, then mm. it's, it's, you know, it's, a great, it's a great point. You're, you're, you're not a successful restaurant if you're not having your customers Instagram right. your talk, food. Talk, you're so not dealing, dealing we, we, we actually reached out to um, Sarah Jessica Parker, of all people, who has a soft spot in her heart for one of our local restaurants, which was struggling, and got her to, to start Instagramming the restaurant. And they've seen, actually, a turnaround in some exactly. of their sales. Um, we, about the vacancies, we, we reached out to retired Hunter College professor Howard Chernick, who argues that landlords do not profit in the long run from empty stores, but will benefit from eliminating or lowering as city council seems about to do for some people, the commercial rent tax. Let's watch. 
why are rents so expensive? Oh, it must be this tax. That's the wrong way to, to look at it, in my view. The cost is so high because rents have risen so much. Why have rents risen so much? Because they can, because New York has been a robust area. A landlord has a calculation to make. Do I eat two or three months or six months or two years of vacancy in the hope that I can land a CVS pharmacy that will pay my asking rent, or do I lower my rent request? Okay. Uh, and what landlords are doing now is, on, uh, by and large, is making the bet that it's better to eat a, a period of vacancy for the high rents they'll get in the future. If I can get the city to help relieve the burden, then that becomes a better bet for me. And it means that the benefit would, if, if the city uh, reduces or relieves the tax, would go mainly to the landlord. Aha, so Senator, let me come back to you on this. Um, you're in the state legislature. This is a city council bill that's expect, expected to pass tomorrow, but affects your district, Manhattan below 96th mm -hmm. Street. Entire district, yeah. um, and it would uh, exempt businesses paying from $250,000 to $500,000 a year in rent from the commercial rent tax. Currently, $250,000 is the limit. So more medium-sized businesses would be exempt. I think Professor Chernick was arguing there that even that's not going to help, because really the benefit's going to go to the landlord, yeah. not to the business owner. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I think you know I've heard from from uh, a lot of my small businesses, they're looking forward to this, uh, you know, raising of the threshold. So congratulations to Dan Grodnick and the city council for, for pushing this through. But it's gotta be part of a multi-faceted approach. It's not the silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. I think, I think you know, we've just heard that it's how do you overcome the challenges of the online marketplace? And uh, again, the Dwayne Reeds and the banks are having the same problem. So we have to provide more assistance to our small businesses. We have to help them renegotiate their leases, Brian. There should be a form lease for small businesses that, let's put it very clearly, is at least neutral or maybe even favors the tenant. Right now, it's very landlord biased. And the small business often doesn't even have an attorney to negotiate that lease. So they're really behind the eight ball in most cases of negotiation. Okay. You know, there's a funny thing that I didn't mention in my article, but that uh, was brought up n on Twitter quite a bit afterward, which is that the zoning, uh, the ni New York City zoning uh, laws of 1961 made side street retail, um, it, it cut it out of the zoning. It made it basically illegal that the stores, sort of our best loved stores in the East Village and the West Village are often the little ones on the side streets, and those are grandfathered in. And if those stores um, are vacant for two years or more, they revert to whatever the, the uh, correct, you know, probably residential use, the zoned use. And a lot of people um, on Twitter commenting on my article said, well, the real fix would be to change that rule in the zoning, which is interesting. Um, I know that at the Real Estate Board of New York luncheon, they really wouldn't want that. They think there's already too many side street stores, and that's the problem. Um, and I could see where making that change would have unintended consequences since those uh, side street, you know, street level apartments are often affordable ones. And so it would cause a whole other problem. But I thought it was an interesting point um, that, you know, there may be some things in the zoning that could be done to make small retail spaces to make more of them or to make them more available. The de Blasio administration, like Bloomberg before it, um, is very focused on zoning changes. Um, I think in Bloomberg's case, more for commercial development, and de Blasio's case, more for housing development. How does it affect your neighborhood? We don't have too much vacant. We don't have any vacancies, any vacant lots in, in, in at the Flatbush Junction area. You know, so, you know, um, most, I would say, 90 Five percent of the properties there are privately owned. Uh, many of them by small land lords. You know, maybe they own. You know, maybe, you know, we have a few that own quite quite a chunk, but majority of them own like two, two or three um, mixed-use buildings. 
Um, we are, because we're a business improvement district and you know, it's um, property owners and the businesses come together and help create mm -hmm. the, the bid. So we're also talking to the um, landlords and connecting them with, Brooklyn College is a primary asset in the area. We have the landlords and the commercial real, real estate groups. We try to get them to have meetings with Brooklyn College on what their expansion plans are so they can uh -huh. begin to plan around. Are they acquiring a lot of property like NYU in the village? <laughs> no, 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 no. But they are looking to do some de developments. I hear they're, you know, they're, you know, they're working on a few projects. Yes. But it's important that the property owners and the businesses under understand that because that has Brooklyn College's cough really has an impact on the neighborhood. So, yes. and they can actually begin to plan towards it and begin to create the, the, the framework to support that um, growth. So when you see the city council lowering the commercial rent tax or exempting more businesses from it in the prime Manhattan area below 96th Street, do you say, oh, good start, that kind of thing is going to help us too? Or do you say, why are they helping Manhattan and not helping our neighborhood too with something similar? Um, or neither? Well, they don't this, have the commercial. We, 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 don't, have we commercial don't have it. We don't have it because we're... we're, we're only it's Manhattan, only Manhattan, Manhattan below 96. Right. In Florida. <laughs> Way below 96. Only, yes, yes. You know? Only two places in the world. Right. So, exactly. Yes. But I would be... I would look at it more in this. I mean, you can have one business owner who is making $25 million. And you can have one business with 20 employees making $10, $10 million. I think... I don't know if there is a generic fix for yes. or for for Vertical. Yes. I think there has yes. to be a structured way to identify to look at these businesses um, revenue size wise and come up with a with a structure that would appropriately fit. Um, we only uh, have about a minute, Carrie. Let's end on a little pop culture history uh, note. I should ask somebody named Carrie about this, but I'm going to ask you because you did the study on how sex and the city <laughs> actually affected. Sure. the real life, retail life of New York? Well, I think it brought in tourists, and still does to this day, tour buses, and uh, folks who want to go to Carrie's favorite bakery, Magnolia Bakery, yeah. which the, is an the interesting- fictional Carrie. The fictional Carrie. Yeah. And, and, and it's an interesting story. Now Magnolia Bakery- Cupcakes. Cupcakes is a local owned business that is thriving and has outposts in different parts uh, of the city and I think now perhaps across the country. So whereas we used to rue the day that Carrie and the sex and the city team came into um, Manhattan, now they've kind of saved uh, a vestige of Bleecker Street and uh, huh. it thrives to this day. Well, you rue it at first because it raised the rent. Yes. Well, because, and out the because all the fashion girls who came to have the cupcakes at Magnolia brought Marc Jacobs, and Marc Jacobs and yes. his many outlets on Bleecker Street raised the rents. So that's, that's the connection. And there we leave it to be continued. Thank, Thank you all you. Very, much Thank you very much for coming You're in. Welcome. And that's our program for this week. We are here each week, midweek, ever hopeful, at the intersection of city politics and everyday life. Do tune into my radio program as well, weekdays 10 a.m. to noon on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.